I'm going to talk about water storage, water diversion problems today. As we get involved in the diversion or storage of water that's flowing naturally in streams, there's a substantial influence on the stream. One effect is the reduction of flow in the stream. And particularly today, I'm going to talk about how the reduction in natural low flows have an impact here in Wyoming. And I'm going to focus on one particular kind of impact, and that is fisheries resources. There's been a variety of techniques, several different methodologies that have been developed to assist in making management decisions, assist in negotiations, you might say, of determining what kind of low flows are needed, minimum flows are needed in order to preserve fish habitat and fishery resources. To name some of the examples, there's the trout cover rating, which Tom Weshey developed with the Water Center. He developed that about 10 years ago in an effort to come up with a means of assessing in-stream flow and how it impacted upon fish. One of the streams that he actually used in the data set that he built the model from was Douglas Creek, the stream that I'm going to talk about today. Another methodology is the Habitat Quality Index, or what we call the HQI. It was developed by Alan Binns, who's with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. It incorporates nine different variables that are measured in the stream or along the stream. And that's used now by the Wyoming Game and Fish Department as their principal method for assessing in-stream flow needs. There's a third technique that's relatively commonly used. It's called the in-stream flow incremental method. It's the one that was developed and it's used primarily by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And many of the states in this vicinity are using that technology as well. Colorado is one. Within that particular approach, there is a habitat simulation model called PHABSIM. I'm going to talk about that some more today, too. The point that I want to make is that all of these techniques have been used to negotiate in-stream flow agreements. You know, they have been used to make some kind of prediction as to the response of habitat for fish to changes in flow. What we've got are agreements now between water developers and various kinds of permitting agencies that are based upon the predictions of those kind of models. And what we believe right now is that those predictions and our negotiations are leading to some kind of preservation or enhancement, in some cases, of fisheries resources. Well, I don't know if that's always the case, and that's what we're talking about today. We did a recent study with the co-op unit. Kathy Raley was the woman who did most of the work. And what we did was raise some serious questions about the agreements that have been promulgated here in the central Rocky Mountains. What we did is we studied compliance. Compliance of water developers with in-stream flow agreements in Colorado, Montana, and Wyoming. What we found is that there's been 119 in-stream flow agreements that have been made between permitting agencies and water develop developers in the three-state area. The problem we ran into is out of that total of 119 stream reaches, there was only stream flow data available on 61 streams where we could even begin to measure or evaluate compliance. In other words, 49% of the sites where there are in-stream flow agreements, there wasn't any data available at all on which to assess compliance. Then when we did look at the 61 streams where there were data, there were some rather shocking things that we found. There was a series of rather catastrophic or chronic failures to comply by water developers. What we found is that 54 of the 61 locations had failures of compliance with the agreement. In other words, at some point in time, the discharge below the diversion structure or below the dam was less than the agreement called for. In 28 of the cases, 28 of 61, the flow there was at least one time when the flow below the diversion stu structure was 25%. In other words, one quarter or less of what had been agreed upon. And when you're already talking about a minimum flow to maintain fisheries resources and reduce it to 25% or less of that flow, you can imagine what some of the impacts might be. In how many cases? 28. 28 of 61. Just to take a little bit different slant to these same data, we talk about chronic impacts. There were 20, or pardon me, 17 cases where over the duration of time when we had flow measurements where 20% of the time or more they were in violation or not in compliance with the agreement. 
In other words, there were several cases where it was just routine to not be up to the minimum flow that had been agreed upon. Well, based upon our data, interviews with the water developers, interviews with the various permitting agencies, one of the things that came about is that one of the reasons for compliance or for lack of compliance is that there's no enforcement. There generally is no enforcement agency or nobody given responsibility to monitor and enforce as a result of these agreements. That's a long way of getting around to the point that I'm to work, today I'm going to talk about assessing the biological effectiveness of minimum in-stream flow agreements. We've got a large institutional problem that we are facing. In order to assess the biological effectiveness, you've got to have the agreement that has been promulgated adhered to. And there are very few situations where that is taking place. Well, this whole story about the assessment of compliance is put together in a report that was put out by the National Ecology Research Center. I'm not going to delve into it much more. If anybody's interested in getting the citation off that, they could write to the National Ecology Center or call them down in Fort Collins to get a copy. So we have an institutional problem regarding in-stream flows. That's not exactly what I want to talk about today. The basic question is regarding in-stream flows at, from the biological perspective. We have today several sophisticated or somewhat sophisticated techniques that are used to determine in-stream flow needs of fish. And these are used to negotiate in-stream flow agreements. But there is one underlying problem. We don't know if they work. We don't have a clue. We have very, very poor understanding or knowledge of the biological consequences of minimum in-stream flows. The mitigation value of minimum in-stream flow agreements has really not been tested. And this is essentially unknown. This is what we're after. And what we're talking about, or what I'm going to be talking about today, is maybe the first one of these kind of problems that's been assessed. We did a, a literature review, and we did not find a single published paper in the peer-reviewed literature that presented biological data measuring the influence of a minimum in-stream flow on fish. And we've been setting these kind of agreements for over 30 years. Carl Armour, who is an employee of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Fort Collins, Colorado, with the National Ecology Center, did a nationwide survey trying to find out if there was any information concerning biological effectiveness of in-stream flows. And what he found is that there are six locations within the United States where there's some kind of monitoring of fish populations that is occurring following the establishment of an in-stream flow. None of these have been published in the peer review literature, most of its file information or monitoring information with various agencies. Overall, I guess what we can say, we just don't know the mitigation value of in-stream flows. Well, the opportunity presented itself here in southeastern Wyoming. What we, have what we were able to do is evaluate the effectiveness of a minimum in-stream flow manipulation on Douglas Creek in the Medicine Bow National Mountains, or Medicine Bow National Forest, the Medicine Bow Mountains, just about 45 miles to the west of here. Rob Roy Dam was constructed in 1963 as part of the Cheyenne Water Project. Water is stored behind Rob Roy Dam and Rob Roy Reservoir and is released from that reservoir so it flows down Douglas Creek for about a mile. And then it's diverted from there through a delivery system to the city of Cheyenne. Back in the 1960s and through the 70s and early 80s, the minimum in-stream flow required below the diversion structure on Douglas Creek was only one cubic foot per second. Natural flow, natural low flow at that particular site on Douglas Creek was about six CFS. So the minimum flow was one-sixth of what nature would have provided in that area. During the period of time when that one CFS minimum flow was occurring, Tom Weshey was working for the Water Center and did a series of studies on Douglas Creek. It's fortuitous that he studied, or did several things on Douglas Creek because what he actually was able to do is define what the fish populations looked like and what the habitat looked like back in the 1970s when a prolonged period of very low flow had, had taken place. Well, as part of stage two of the Cheyenne Water Project, Rob Roy Reservoir was expanded. And negotiations took place with the Forest Service for another permit for operations on the forest. 
And with the permit for the expansion of the project came the requirement that a five and a half CFS minimum flow take place below the water diversion structure. That particular negotiation was a large part, uh, to a large part due to the work of Tom Weshey and Dennis Jesperson. Dennis worked for the U.S. Forest Service at the time on the Medicine Bow, and Tom was working with the Water Center. But what that led to is that beginning in 1986, the minimum flow below the diversion was enhanced. It was increased to five and a half. And this is where we came in. We were asked by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service National Ecology Center if, there, if we could identify any situations where we could evaluate the biological effectiveness of in-stream flow. And it just happened that we had a situation here near, near, near home. Two things came together. One is that the city of Cheyenne has been religious in maintaining the in-stream flow agreements. They have complied, as far as we can tell, with the, with the agreement up to this point. Secondly, there was pre-manipulation of flow information concerning the system. The data that Tommy collected back in the 1960s enabled us to make some comparisons. Now, it wasn't necessarily the best data that would have been gathered if we would have known that this is the kind of manipulation that was going to take place. But it is pretty good information for us to make some comparisons to. So with that, I think we'll turn on some slides. Frank, oh, oh, that's been on all the way. All. <laughs> Shows how much awake I am. This is a slide of Douglas Creek. As I mentioned before, it's in the Medicine Bow National Forest. Its headwaters are in the Snowy Range at about 10,400 feet in elevation, right at Timberline. It flows south and west through the forest and ends up flowing into the North Platte River. Where it goes into the Platte River, it's about a 7,500 foot elevation. So it's a substantial change in elevation. It has a lot of variation in habitat quality over the length of the stream. The section that we're focusing on is only 22 miles of the stream, however. This is the brown trout. It's the most common fish species found in Douglas Creek, and it's the target of our work the target of our evaluation. The reason it becomes the target, well, it's the fish that is most valued for a sport fishery. There are some other species that occur in the Douglas Creek drainage, however. One is the brook trout. The brook trout is common in the headwater areas. Not a good slide, as it appeared to be earlier. <laughs> brook trout occurs in the headwater areas and in the small tributaries. Within the main stem of Douglas Creek, it occurs, but it's not a primary animal. It doesn't occur in high abundance. There are a couple other fish that occur in fair abundance in the lower stretches that we were studying. One's called the long-nosed sucker, and the other one's called the white sucker. And they make up a substantial amount of the biomass present in the stream at areas below about 8,500 8, feet in elevation. There's also present at the lower elevation sites two other minnow species, one called the long-nosed dace, and the other one the creek chub. And these pro provide some fair forage for brown trout, only at the lower elevation zone. Most of the areas upstream from that, the brown trout have to feed almost exclusively on insect material that's drifting in the water or falling into the water. Douglas Creek is not exactly a pristine stream. There are several different things that have occurred to Douglas Creek over the years. It has been impacted by human, by human development. The two primary impacts in the past have been tie drives and gold dredging. Railroad ties were cut and shaped in the headwater areas of Douglas Creek. Then they were stored there during the wintertime. When the spring runoff occurred, high water, that's then when they were floated downstream. And this particular shot slide is showing the floating of ties in one of the smaller sections of Douglas Creek, not too far probably be from below the dam, where the dam is located today. The, da the logs were floated into the North Platte River, down the Platte River to the Fort Steele area, about in the vicinity of the I-80 bridge, and that's where they were lo loaded then onto railroad, ca railroad cars and transported wherever they were needed. Well, the ties themselves did a substantial amount of damage to the fish habitat in the stream. You know, as they moved through the stream, they had a rather scouring effect. But also, to enable those ties to move easier, the people who were doing these kind of operations tended to straighten the stream channel where they could or to remove natural debris jams get to facilitate the flow of these logs. Altogether, there was a substantial reduction in fish habitat that occurred in many areas of Douglas Creek. The second major impact that has occurred in Douglas Creek through the history of development in this area is gold dredging. 
Gold dredging occurred primarily in the lower gradient sections of the stream where there were gravel deposits. The system that was used is something similar to this modern day version. There's no longer any activity of this, of this type going on in Douglas Creek. But this is an example. And the kind of spoil piles that are shown here, the kind of modification of the channel, the loss of fish habitat that's expressed here is a lot like what took place in Douglas Creek back at the turn of the century and after that. There are still spoil piles similar to those seen here that are visible along the banks of Douglas Creek that have not become revegetated. This is a picture of a typical section of low gradient area in Douglas Creek today. It tends to be a very wide, shallow channel. Very, there's very few deep pools. There's very few overhanging structures like undercut bank, things like that, that provide habitat for, for fish. The, the habitat's been changed substantially. You, want to you put on top of that the impact of extremely low flows, and there's not much fish habitat left. In this particular side, you can, slide, you can actually see some old spoil piles right through here and here. That's the remnants of some of the gold dredging in the past. This is a picture of Rob Roy Dam in one of our study reaches that's immediately below the dam. Again, this is a typical picture of a low gradient reach. Not much habitat for fish that's present there. Above the dam, Rob Roy Reservoir is a you know, rather pretty stream, a pretty reservoir. It provides a lot of sport fishing for a variety of species, and it's a rather attractive place for recreational interest. Rob Roy Reservoir can store up to 35,000 acre feet of water. It's a substantial water storage structure. As I mentioned, water is released from Rob Roy Reservoir and allowed to flow about one mile in the original stream channel to where it is diverted. And this is a picture of the diversion structure. It is below this structure that in the 1960s, 70s, and early 80s that only a one CFS minimum flow occurred. Today, below this structure, a five and a half CFS minimum flow is occurring. It's at this point that water is diverted from the stream into a delivery system to the city of Cheyenne. From this point on the creek, Douglas Creek flows 22 miles down to the mouth at the, with the North Platte River. Before I proceed, I want to give you some picture, some kind of visual image of the influence of the minimum stream flow on Douglas Creek. This is a shot of one reach of Douglas Creek back in the 1970s when a one CFS minimum flow was in effect. There is very little water in that stream. There's not much place in many areas, not, much, not many places for, for trout to live. By comparison, this is a similar reach in 1988 when a five and a half CFS minimum flow was in effect. While it's still not the best brown trout habitat, there is a rather noticeable difference. I'm going to jump way to our lowest study site, the one furthest downstream. This is below Pelton Creek as you enter into, or actually you are in the wilderness area to, with this, where this picture is taken. This is downstream from Muddy Creek, Lake Creek, and Pelton Creek. All of them are unregulated tributaries. All of these add flow to Douglas Creek. This is a picture taken back in the 1970s during a late summer low flow period. There was not much water at that time. Now you see a large rock right here and a slanted tree. Use that as a reference point. There's the rock and the slanted tree again. This picture was taken in the summer of 1988 after the 5.5 CFS minimum flow was in effect. Actual flow as a re at this point, in the day that picture was taken, was around 11 CFS. That's as a result of additional accretion flows from the three major tributaries upstream. But you can see the, the visual effect that is already, it takes place as a result of the enhanced flow. Weshe, Vic Hosfurther, and some others have worked here at the university in establishing that, that flow. And I wouldn't try to get into all the mechanics of that <laughs> and how, how effective it will be over time. One of the other things that uh, is taking place there now, too, there's a substantial amount of beaver activity that's developing. And that's going to serve to trap sediment in some places, and when the beaver dams break, to add sediment in other locations, too. So, Are you ready again? OK. Let me get back to what I was talking about. I showed two slides, one of what, this particular section of Douglas Creek back in the 1970s, when it was undergoing an extremely low flow. 
Then I showed it again in, the, in 1988 when the 5.5 CFS minimum flow was in effect. This is just another picture taken in 1988, and it shows the same reach earlier in the summer. In July, at this time, there was a 42.2 CFS discharge is taking place. This is kind of a typical flow. Certainly is not even the highest flow that takes place within the stream, but it's something that would probably create maximal amount of fish habitat in the stream. I don't think the flushing flow was taking place. I think this was due to discharge from Muddy Creek, Pelton Creek. Yeah. I think the five and a half CFS flow was in effect below the dam. I want to get into our study design a little bit. This is a schematic drawing of Douglas Creek. It illustrates how we segregated the stream into four reaches for our study. This, this is the vertical slide you asked about. <laughs> Reach one at the very top is between Douglas Creek Dam and the diversion structure. This is a section of stream that Probably in the past, it looks like the records show the minimum flow was somewhere around 3 CFS. When in operation, they flowed water down that particular stream pretty much constantly to the diversion. With the enhanced flow, the minimum flow between the dam and the diversion structure is now 5 CFS. There's no storage capacity at that structure, so they have to run at least 5 CFS through there in order to maintain the flow below the dam. And you say, well, what the devil? You've been talking about 5.5 CFS. Where's the other half of a cubic foot per second come from? Well, there's another little stream that flows in from the west right at the diversion that provides one half of a cubic foot per second of flow to the stream. And this was considered in the minimum flow agreement. Reach 2 is from the diversion down to Lake Creek. There's another little stream that comes in at in the vicinity of Lake Creek called Muddy Creek. This is the particular section of stream that was most seriously impacted by the low flows back in the 1960s and 70s. This is a section of stream that really had about a 1 CFS minimum flow. Once you get down to Lake Creek and Muddy Creek, the flow is enhanced as a result of flow from those streams. Reach 3 between Lake Creek and Pelton Creek naturally had a low flow of somewhere around six or, or pardon me eight or nine CFS and it was reduced somewhat by the uh, development upstream and then the last street stream or section was reach four below Pelton Creek down to Devil's Gate again this would have been the least impacted section of stream as a result of the water development what we expected is that as you move from reach two to reach three to reach four is that the influence of the new minimum flow would be would decline. There would have been less of an impact of the higher flows as a result of the fact that there's accretion flows from these streams. This is a comparison of the measured or estimated mean annual low flows back in the 1970s to what we saw in 1988 at our three reaches. Look at reach two particularly. A one CFS minimum flow in 1970, a 5 CFS in 1988. Reach 3, 6 versus 9, and reach 4, 8 versus 11. This is an, an example of how the relative change in flow declines as you move downstream. Well, besides segregating our study streams into four reaches depending upon variation in flow, we segregated each reach into gradient classes. This is one picture that shows the two gradient classes that we used. In the foreground is a lower gradient reach, less than 1% channel slope. In the background is a more moderate or higher gradient reach, something greater than 1%. We segregated the stream into those two kinds of classes for several reasons. First, the physical features that form the channel differ between the low gradient and the high gradient areas. Also, the features that form fish habitat differ between the two. And the third is that the impacts that tie drives and gold dredging had differed between these two channel types. This is a low gradient reach. Again, it's in a slow moving part of the stream, a relatively slow moving part. Meadow type areas, places where there's substantial alluvial deposits, gravel deposits. 
It's in these areas that the stream can meander. The meandering process of the stream can take place. As a result of this meandering process, you get substantial riffle pool development, undercut banks form. You get that kind of a habitat that's present for fish. Also, because of the nature of these channels and the underlying soils, this is, these are the locations that were most seriously impacted by gold dredging. Those are the ones that were torn up by the gold dredging operations. Let me contrast this to the higher gradient, moderate gradient reaches as we call them. These are areas of the stream where the channel is controlled by rock, rock outcroppings. That stream doesn't meander, as you can see. It just flows straight down the mountainside. What forms fish habitat in these areas are the boulders. The boulders either create little pocket pools or plunge pools, and those are the places where fish can hide. The tie drives had some influence on these areas. You can see, though, as you're driving ties through there, they wouldn't damage those rocks too much, but they would tend to remove the natural accumulation of woody debris that would form more of a stair-stepping process, tend to slow down the currents, accumulate some sediments and things like that. You can also see that there wasn't much gold dredging in a stretch like this. It just wasn't. The techniques that they used for gold dredging just didn't apply here. Also, there wouldn't have been much accumulation of gold, and there was no sediment there to, to dredge. Let me get back to the objectives of, our, of the project. What we wanted to do is look at brown trout population and, and habitat changes with increased minimum flows in Douglas Creek. In order to do this, in 1988 and back in the 1970s, we electrofished those stream reaches that I identified earlier in order to determine the abundance of fish and the size of the fish that were present. For those who are involved, interested in, fishing, in fisheries techniques, we used depletion esti estimators, three-pass depletion estimates. We only estimated the abundance of fish that were greater than four inches in length. The reason we did that is we're avoiding the young of the year fish. And we avoid those because they have a very fast growth rate. They have very high mortality rates. They're hard to sample. And we felt that they would add some really more bias to our estimates than, than anything else. And besides, that's the way Tom did it back, back in the 1970s. So we didn't want to change the techniques. All of the fish that we collected were weighed, measured. This was enable, to, to enable us to estimate standing stock. The biomass of fish per unit of surface area, the pounds per acre of fish that were present. This is a typical size range of the fish that are found, the brown trout that are found in Douglas Creek. Maximum length is somewhere around 15 or 16 inches. Fish of that length are probably four to six years of age. That's what we believe right now, but we're going to do some, coming work, some work this coming summer to see if that's always true. We caught a few bigger fish. This particular picture is one of our, the bigger fish we caught and some of our crew members, some of the stranger people on the crew. <laughs> I only said that because one of them is sitting here in the audience. We use transect techniques to measure habitat features in the channel. Same techniques were used in, in the 1970s as in 1988. And data, data were gathered using these techniques in order to use three different models to assess how habitat changed, what habitat features had changed with the enhanced flow. Going back to models that I mentioned earlier, the three that we used for the physical habitat simulation system developed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the habitat quality index used by the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, and the trout cover rating developed by Tom Weshey at the Water Center. So we'll get, we'll get to the question, does the enhanced flow have any influence? Was there a biological response? Well, this is a comparison of the standing stock estimates made by Tom back in the 1970s to those that we made in the 19 in 1988. Now this is only two years after the enhanced flow. This is only two years following the increase in minimum flow from 1 to 5.5 CFS. We don't have the, the exact same comparisons made because there were some cases back in the 1970s where there's just no work done at that site. But we incorporated sites in order to get the two gradient classes I was talking about into the picture in the 1980s. Site 1 though immediately below the diversion. 37 to 117 pounds per acre change. Now these are rough estimates. If I told you all the assumptions that went into making the estimates and some of the problems with measurement, you could say, well, that's a figure plus or minus 15 or 20%. And that, that's the kind of accuracy that we have. 
But nevertheless, it looks like there was a threefold increase within two years in standing stock. As we get down to reach three, remember this is a site where the actual increase in, min in minimum flow went from six to nine. There's, it looks like there's about at least maybe a doubling of standing stocks. And then down here, at reach four, really not much you can say whether there's any change at all that's significant. Now this is a change in standing stock that's based upon a per unit area basis. Let me so show you what this means. The surface area, as a result of the enhanced flow, increased substantially. Immediately below the diversion, there was a doubling, essentially, of the surface area of water. As you move downstream, it increased by about 50%. This particular site, the comparison between the two time periods is not particularly valid because of some changes in channel structure that occurred as a result of Beaver. And then as you move down to the fourth site, the lowest site below Pelton Creek, there was not very much change at all. Surface area doubled here. At the same time, standing stock went up threefold. In other words, if you actually think of that, the biomass increase in this stretch at this site was six times, six times greater in 1988 than it was in the, in 19, in the 1970s. This is a figure that Steve Wolf had put together for another presentation that illustrates some of what I'm talking about. What he was showing here is trying to get some kind of an evaluation of what the overall impact was on the 22 miles of Douglas Creek that we were looking at. And these are extrapolations of just how much surface area of habitat was obtained in low and moderate gradient channel reaches as a result of the enhanced flow. And subsequently, the impact upon the total standing stock or the total biomass of brown trout. Among those channels that were low gradient channels below reach two, it went from 210 pounds total of brown trout to an estimated 1,100 pounds of brown trout, or 160 to over 1,000 in moderate gradient channels. You can see I won't point, point out all the figures, and I certainly discredit the last one, set of figures down here. But I think it's pretty obvious that within two years of the enhanced flow, there's some pretty good information to, to say it has paid off, and there is a value to that increased flow. That's going to mean more fish that can be, I won't say harvested, but can be utilized by fishermen. I don't want to dwell on it, but I want to talk a little bit about the results of the habitat modeling work. These are the models now that are being used to predict population responses. These are the models that we are using, in many cases, to negotiate in-stream flow agreements. Here's a situation where we have a known change in flow and a known change in, or an indicated change in populations. And now we're going to look at how the models respond. PHAPSIM is the result is the results of PHAPSIM simulation is what I'm presenting here. The results are presented as weighted usable area. What they're saying is this is the area that is suitable now for a, adult, juvenile, fry habitat, or as spawning habitat as fish. Three variables go into that computation. Water depth, current velocity, and substrate. Reach two. You recall we were talking about a six-fold increase in biomass. That may be, it holds true somewhat when we look at the weighted usable area computation. It tends to predict about that kind of a change. On the other hand, juvenile habitat doesn't change much. Fry habitat actually goes down. Spawning habitat goes up. It varies the kind of response that we see from one reach to another. But the PHABSIM indication is that when you apply it to a particular reach, it does seem to make sense. One of the problems is that an underlying assumption is that weighted usable area is correlated with standing stock of fish. We didn't see that. And in other assessments of standing stock, that were PHABs in results, weighted usable area and standing stock have been compared. Nobody else has seen it either. So that leaves us some problems in interpreting these results. But here's where some of the real problems take place. This is the results of the habitat quality index. As I mentioned, there's nine variables that are measured, plugged into a multiple regression model, and it makes a prediction of estimated standing stocks of fish in the stream. At site one, immediately below the dam, 
it looks like there's about a six or seven fold increase in standing stocks that would be predicted by that model. Well, that's somewhat close to what we would or what we saw when we made biological measurements. On the other hand, site three and site four actual, actually shows the estimated standing stock going down. Now that was due to one variable in the model, and that's a variable that measures cover. And it measures cover in relationship to surface area, percent cover that's present in the stream. Well, what happened in Douglas Creek, if you recall these wide channels with no overhanging banks, as the water surface spread out, the same rocks, the same boulders were still inundated. It really didn't increase the amount of cover. If you use that particular model to evaluate the, the, the value of an enhanced flow or an increase in in-stream flow in Douglas Creek, it would actually show a negative effect. And that's not exactly the case. But that's some of the limitations of the model, the way the variables are defined within the model. And this is the last situation, and that's Tom's trout cover rating. Trout cover is defined by Tom as two kinds of variables, overhanging bank cover or rubble boulder cover in the stream. And again, it's one of these manipulations where it's related to surface area. And the trout cover ratings for these sites, you can see they showed some substantial declines as a result of the enhanced flow. That's not exactly what it did at all. But originally, that particular model was driven mostly by the presence of overhanging banks. And overhanging banks are just not present in Douglas Creek. So my point to make here is if we just use the predictions of some of the common models, the common tools that are used, we certainly get different kinds of assessment of what's going on in Douglas Creek than what we have today. All of the models have an assumption that the prediction of the model is related to standing stocks. The only model that, that we use that had that kind of relationship was the trout cover rating. I won't dwell on that. but. It just is another indication of some of the limitations of these tools. I want to summarize just a little bit. This is Rob Roy Dam, and there's a diversion below that dam, one mile downstream. Construction of that dam originally, and the diversion re re resulted in a reduction in flow from 6 to 1 CFS. Many of the sections of Douglas Creek were rather severely dewatered as a result of that, and there were impacts upon the fishery. But at the same time, there had been other historic impacts, the tie drives and the gold mining. And it's a real chore to sort out those confounding problems. There are other problems taking place in some of the areas of Douglas Creek today, and that's impacts of cattle grazing, particularly in the Pelton Creek region. There are re recent impacts where bank sloughing and trampling of the banks are taking place as a result of cattle. Reaches tend to be in the neighborhood of 100 to 150 yards long. So they're relatively long reaches. And they tend to have a lot of diversity that would be typical of the stream reach to them. But some of them are better habitat than others. And that, that's this, and this is an example of one. Yeah, there, no, that's the continuing continuous recording of stream flow. And uh, it there's at the diversion structures where those kind of, that kind of data was taken. And there was two other sites historically on the creek that had that kind of information. And using a variety of hydrologic models, and there's some simulation that can take place as you move downstream. It seems intuitive here to me that if you have more water for fish to live in, you're going to live in. Uh, but if this is going to that is the observation of people who have cabins along that stream, they, they, they find that it's not fishing has gone down considerably in the last three years. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know if we're losing our technique <laughs> for fishing. And we don't, a lot of us don't keep fishing. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. well, you know, I wouldn't know how to respond to your observation, except to say that you know, the, the observations we're making, you know, it's, it tends to confirm that the standing stocks there are similar or better than they were in the 1980s or 1970s. <laughs> okay, but are you ready? Okay, let, let me finish up. One of the problems I was mentioning is the historical impacts as well as current cattle grazing impacts. A large mitigation project has been developed by the Forest Service. 
where they're actually going to try to restore some of the stream bank, bank integrity, some of the features of the stream bank, like overhanging bank features over time. Tom Weshey with the Water Center developed that kind of a that plan for them, and they're going to institute that beginning here in 1989. The first stretch that they're going to work on is that stretch of, between Rob Roy Dam and the diversion structure. But over the next several years, they'll extend that all the way down through the Pelton Creek area into the area adjacent to the uh, wilderness. Uh, to the wilderness. This is probably the best, or some of the best, habitat that's still left on Douglas Creek. It's in the Pelton Creek meadow, as we call it, downstream from Pelton Creek. You can see on the left bank, there's a substantial amount of overhanging structure. That's the kind of habitat that they're trying to restore on the stream. The alternatives that exist is to use what they call tree revetments that will enhance, or that kind of habitat will develop over the course of a decade. The other is to actually go in and use some very expensive techniques. We're talking $100,000 per mile of stream to enhance habitat. That's beyond the capabilities of the Forest Service or any other management agency. That's the kind of techniques that are often used in Wisconsin or Iowa, places where they have half-mile sections of trout stream and they can put a lot of money into it. We're not using techniques that are as intensive on the medicine bow, but I think in the long haul, they will have a better response. The work that we've done in 1988, looking at the population response and habitat response, is just the first year. We're going to be continuing that particular project for at least two more years. One of the major questions is, have we hit some kind of a stability in this system? What kind of natural fluctuation takes place? And can we get a better understanding as to what the dynamics of this system is? What actual features may be limiting trout production in the stream over the next several years. Doug Harris, who's a graduate who will begin graduate school this summer here at the university, will be working on that as his master's degree project for the next two years. And beyond that point, I don't know exactly what we might be doing, but I would hope we'll continue to work up there for some time to come. So. Any other questions? Well, what's the data that he collected on this farm? Oh, he, Rich Grost is the young man's name, and he has been working on description of brown trout reds in Douglas Creek. He's developing an, a methodology for assessing the impact of sediment on survival to emergence, the period of time when they are incubating in the gravels. And we're, the idea is to take his information and to apply it to some laboratory work that's been done by Mike Young. And Mike's in the back of the room where he's looked at in the laboratory the relationship between sediment in the gravels and, incub and emergence or survival of these animals. The whole idea is to assess over the entire Medicine Bow National Forest, the impacts of sediment in sub, some areas. But uh, we selected Douglas Creek as a place to study because it was not highly, we didn't believe, was highly s impacted by sediment at this time. Mike, do you have any feel for how exploitation might have changed uh, sediment today? No. <laughs> you know, it, it's used substantially, and exploitation, the, the use of the stream is probably continually going up. But there are more and more people who are, like this gentleman, releasing fish. So uh, it's hard to say just what kind of exploitation rates are taking place. We'll let Dan O'Shea figure that one out. Yeah, another fact you mentioned briefly, which I'm sure also impacts the, the uh, actual fishery, is the uh, beaver dam. Yeah, in fact. There's a couple other dimensions to that. Beaver, a lot of these meadows, the original habitat for fish was created by beaver activity. They construct dams, the dams serve as sediment traps, they fill up, eventually blow out, and then there's a meandering channel that forms through those beaver ponds, or the, the silted in beaver ponds. That's some of the best habitat that's available for fish anywhere on the Medicine Bow, those kind of meadows. There's none of that left. But as soon as this minimum flow was established, the beaver went crazy. I mean, they have really been constructing a lot of dams and impacting upon the system. I mean, physically changing many of these reaches rather dramatically. Today, they're providing deep water. In years to come, as these sites silt in, I don't know what it'll be. But it, the beaver activity is a very natural thing. It's a, very, it's a process that works to form channels, to form habitat. The beaver ponds are particularly valuable in the wintertime for some fish species in, in the mountains, because that's where, that's where slow water is, is present. They don't have to fight the current. And they spend the winter in those areas. There's some other problems, though, with the beaver, and that is as you move down through the canyon area near to the mouth of the creek, there are some substantial beaver dams that have been formed down there in the last few years. 
probably back in the 1970s, in the fall associated with spawning, there was spawning sized fish that actually could move all the way up into Pelton Creek area or even the Lake Creek area to spawn. I don't know, I don't think they're able to do that anymore. That there are, uh, that these barriers that exist due to the beaver dams are preventing them from moving up. So I, that's, that's a couple different dimensions of positive and negative aspects of beaver in the system. But they're going to have a, they're probably some of the most measurable and, di and one, some of the most dynamic. They're, they are some of the most measurable and dynamic forces, I should say, in the system. In this reach, too, there are some people who are, uh, I don't know if they go in there for gold and do a lot of uh, pop and they suck out and then throw it back into the stream. Mm -hmm. Did you, did you uh, see any impact? Well, that, we didn't evaluate it. There certainly wasn't anything like that going on that, that we could see in the reaches that we were studying. But uh, gold dredging has been shown in many different parts of the country has a negative impact on fish by the resuspension of fine sediment, the redistribution of fine sediment in a stream. Why yeah, Mark. The Okay, the relationship between deep water and rocks. Basically, cover to a fish is created by protection from the current and a place to hide in order to move out and to you know, prey upon drifting food items. That cover may be in the form, and for some fish, of big boulders. In some cases, it might just be something this big, where they actually can sit on it with their nose and come up off the bottom. But that's not being measured by these models, and I think that's part of the, the overall problem. There's some, some of the behavioral dimensions are just not accumulated. These models were developed for some very generalized applications. And here we're trying to apply them specifically to brown trout, to one stream reach, and uh, that's some of the problem. Also, the kind of streams that they were developed on were probably different, were different in many respects from what Douglas Creek looks like as a result of the past impacts of tie drives in gold, in gold dredging. I don't know if I exactly understand the well, question. Security is, for instance, they drive to, to set a, a minimum flow from Douglas Creek. Well, they're going to have to have a minimum flow from Douglas Creek. We saw that the, the predictions you come up with may be erroneous. And mm -hmm. what was actually done, it seems, is that when they upped the minimum flow to five and a half, they were doing that because six was about the, the historical minimum. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm wondering if that's maybe just a better way to go. It seemed just com com computing surface area, that some of the most simple models for assessing in-stream flow appear to be ones that may be most useful, such as a Forest Service R2 cross-section technique, wetted perimeter, and things like that. I think that's what may be indicated here. I don't know if that's addressing your question exactly, but... Uh, yeah, well, I understand yeah. historical records are pretty hard to come. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's right. In fact, they're almost non-existent. I don't know if it's good information, but the, a little folklore. The fellow that was county attorney in Albany County just before when Douglas Creek was running natural, naturally said that he prosecuted more people for overlimit on fish out of Douglas Creek than any other place in the county. <laughs> folklore. <laughs> That's ex exploitation of fish, whether you know, in excess of the game regulations or within game regulations is a problem. And it does impact upon total abundance of fish in these streams. Tom and I did another project several years ago looking at brown trout and evaluating another management tool for brown trout that assessed habitat. And what we were doing is comparing several different streams, 28 different streams in southwestern or southeastern Wyoming. And we threw one variable in there in the assessment just to see how it would work to see if we could accommodate or account for some of the variation among streams that would be due to fishing pressure. And that variable just was one of classifying access. We considered three different levels of fishing based upon access. Very low fishing on private lands, moderate levels of fishing on public land within a mile of a road, and the lowest level, or the, pardon me, the 
moderate level was greater than half a mile from a road on public lands, and the lowest level would be on public lands within a half mile of a road. And that ended up being a significant predictor of standing stocks. I, using you know, multiple regression techniques, it had an R square of 0.17. You know, if you th it's not exactly you know, high, but nevertheless, it was statistically significant. And I think that there is some of that that's influencing things. That's part of the whole trend today of going more and more towards catch and release you know, fishing or very limited harvest. Yeah, I have to cut it off this yeah. There's a class in here yeah. after this. We thank you. No, th I enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, for those that are taking a seminar for a class, if you have a few minutes, we'll move uh, Wayne into the other room or any other room.